Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Daryl Haggard. I'm a faculty member um, in the physics department at McGill University and also in the McGill Space Institute. And I'm here to talk to you today about why black holes are awesome. So Jay already talked a little bit this morning about the word awesome. So I mean awesome in both its colloquial way, that they're just super cool, um, but also that they are really full of awe. Um, I get to study these objects all the time, and it's pretty fantastic. Um, so I'm hoping to do a little call and response with you all. So um, this is partly just because I know you're caffeinated, because you just came back from the coffee break, and I know you have some calories in you. Um, so I'm going to ask you things like, what planet do you live on? Come on, you can do better than that. What planet do you live on? OK, and so when I ask you, what are black holes, you're going to say black holes are? Thank you. OK, so black holes are awesome. But actually, that's not even the real title of my talk. The real title of my talk, um, Amy Cook, our organizer, thought was just a little too um, glib. Uh, so what I really wanted to call this talk was Black Holes Don't Suck. And once again, I mean this both in its colloquial sense and in a real sense, vac black holes are not vacuum cleaners. They do not walk through the galaxy sucking things in. That's not what happens with black holes. And so I'm going to try to explain and motivate this um, particular sophisticated philosophy of mine for you today. Um, so what, to start off by talking about what is a black hole, I'm going to give you my favorite definition. Um, you heard this a little bit, actually, I think Gil Holder and our last session was talking a bit about escape velocities. Um, so the, my favorite definition of a black hole is an object whose escape velocity exceeds the speed of light. So you all know about escape velocities, even if you don't know that you know about escape velocities, because you've all thrown a baseball. And what happens when I throw a baseball? falls back down. I am not superhuman. My space balls just fall down. In fact, they're really kind of pitiful. I don't even have a good throwing arm. So um, if you throw a baseball, it falls back down to the surface of the Earth, unless you can throw it at the escape velocity of our Earth. So the escape velocity of our Earth is around 12 kilometers per second. If you can eject that baseball off the surface of the Earth at higher than 12 kilometers per second, you can get it off of the, out of the gravitational potential well, we'd say, um, of the Earth. So it turns out that a black hole is an object whose gravity is so intense its mass is so concentrated in such a small volume of space that its escape velocity, in fact, exceeds the speed of light, and that makes the inside of a black hole invisible. Um, so I'd like to also borrow a theme from Dick Bond's talk about simplicity um, and simplicity moving toward complexity. So it turns out that black holes are some of the most simple objects in the universe, though they are exotic and cool. Um, they can be characterized with really only two properties in an astrophysical setting. Their mass, how much mass they contain, and their spin, how rapidly they're rotating. Um, so when we, as observers, I am an observational astronomer, when we go out, these are the two properties we would like to learn about black holes in our universe, in our galaxy. Um, they do sometimes have charge in a theoretical setting. Astrophysically, that gets neutralized very quickly by material all around the black hole. So for all intents and purposes, we care about the mass and the spin of black holes. Um, OK, so I, to I told you my very favorite definition, this notion of an escape velocity. Just to throw out some of the other terminology you might have heard before, um, Gil, Gil also mentioned the event horizon. So this is the, the radius within which light is trapped, the sort of dimension, the, the radius of the black hole. That's a, a term you've probably heard. Sometimes you might hear of them talk, um, discussed as sort of a singularity, uh, a one over zero kind of calculation, something that drops to infinity. Um, and this notion of a singularity is intimately tied up with this idea that our whole universe is embedded in a framework which we can refer to as space-time, uh, a sort of uh, fabric that is made up not only of space and of time. And when you put masses into this fabric, they slightly perturb the fabric, they change the shape of it and cause Photons cause light to move differently. This is a sort of simple artist's impression of what the sun, a white dwarf, and a neutron star might look like um, in the fabric of space-time. And far over here, um, to your right, is a black hole which causes this um, fabric of the universe to be so depressed that actually that little peak can go all the way down to infinity. So sort of a sing an idea of a singularity in the fabric of space-time. So they are simple, but they are exotic, and we cannot see inside. And so we are left to wonder about black holes um, and to learn about them by looking looking at their environment, looking at what happens around the black hole as a way of trying to get at what, what these objects are in our universe. 
All right, so just to help you have a little bit of a scale, I talked about the Earth and the escape velocity of the Earth. If you were to take our whole Earth, including you and me and all these chairs you're sitting on and your mom and your uncle and your friend that lives across the world, you took all of it and you smashed it down into something right about the size of a sugar cube that you could put into your coffee cup right now, our Earth would become a black hole. So it's not so much that the matter in the black holes is completely different than what you and I have here. It's just that it's really, really, really packed down into a very, very tiny volume. So one other example, um, if we took our sun and we smashed it down into something um, the size of roughly like a three kilometer circle around the Ontario Science Center where we sit right now, um, our sun itself would become a black hole. So you can see that these objects here are very, 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 very small compared to the space that they take up in the universe in their kind of normal non-black hole state. Um, okay, so what would happen if you took our sun, you made it into a black hole, and you replaced the sun that we have in the center of our solar system with that black hole? So anybody want to venture a guess as to what would happen to the orbits of all of our planets? Here's an artist's impression of our beautiful solar system, less the sun, but with a black hole in the middle. Oh, you guys are so smart. Nothing would happen, and why would nothing happen? Come on, what's our name of our talk? Why does nothing happen? because black holes don't slack. Thank you, okay, that's right. So the planets would stay in orbit around the black hole um, because the mass of the object, the mass of the black hole that you replace the sun with has stayed exactly the same, which means the orbital, the gravitational potential well that those planets are orbiting in is identical to the one that it was before. We would all die a very, very cold death. So don't get me wrong, this would not be a happy occurrence, um, but indeed the orbits of the planets would not be changed by replacing the sun with a black hole of the same mass. So if you'd like some more kind of amazing and to me exotic evidence that this is indeed true and that we can measure this type of an environment in our own Milky Way galaxy, I give you one of the most amazing videos in astrophysics. This is going to be a picture of stars orbiting around the supermassive black hole called Sagittarius A star that lives at the heart of our Milky Way galaxy. So, oh, sorry, I forgot. Black holes don't suck. Okay, so this is a picture that starts, you'll notice the dates, it starts back in 1995. This is a picture, the colored, the sort of rainbow blobs are individual stars um, whose orbits have been measured um, as they orbit around an empty um, position in space. All of these colored lines mark out the individual orbits, the motions of the stars over about 20 years. And you can see the little white star is there to mark the position that is at the focus of each one of those ellipses as those stars, stars orbit around. Um, and indeed, we can see that these stars are not falling to their death into the black hole. They are stably orbiting around this gravitating object, this supermassive black hole which has four million times the mass of our own sun that lives right at the heart of our Milky Way galaxy. Not only do black holes not suck, they also tend to throw things out with great violence sometimes. So this is another amazing discovery about our own Milky Way galaxy, and we think it might be connected back to the black hole that lives at the heart of the galaxy. These are the so-called Fermi bubbles. So this is an artist's impression of the Fermi bubbles with a data, a picture of the Milky Way galaxy, um, a sort of artist uh, visualization of the Milky Way galaxy running across the middle, and these two enormous bubbles rising up above and below below the, the plane of the Milky Way's disk. So these Fermi bubbles were first detected at very, very high, rate wavelength, high energy wavelengths um, in the gamma ray, and it looks like these um, are symmetric on either side of our galaxy and filled with this high energy radiation. And we think that this may be evidence that there was a big outburst of energetic um, particles from our supermassive black hole or vicinities very, very close to the supermassive black hole in the heart of the galaxy around 10,000 years ago. Um, and so we can use tracers like this to try to understand not only how um, mass evolves and changes in the vicinity of the black hole, but how that black hole might um, cause mass to fly out of our galaxy in all dimensions. Okay, so if black holes don't suck, how exactly do black holes grow? So I told you that the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way galaxy is around four million times the mass of our sun. So all that mass has to get in there somehow. Um, and so this is the type of science that my group does at McGill. We study how mass actually does get into the supermassive black hole um, at the heart of our Milky Way and other supermassive black holes. 
So this is another artist's impression of what we call an accretion disk of mass flowing into the black hole. It's falling down, not being sucked in. Um, and that mass actually makes it down into the black hole because of something that you're all very familiar with. So friction, if you just rub your two hands together, they get warm. If you were to look at your hands after you do that with an infrared camera, you'll see they're radiating a little bit extra energy. You heat it up the skin between your two rubbing palms. And that friction causes energy to be given off. It causes particles to lose some energy and hence to fall in um, to the supermassive black hole. So material does fall into the black hole without the black hole having to suck it in at all. Um, so these are called accretion disks. These are extremely hot and bright. Um, because the, the potential well, the gravitational potential of black holes is so very, very, very deep. And these accretion disks allow us to study black holes across the universe. We can study small ones in our own galaxy. We can study the big one at the center of our galaxy. We can study big ones at the centers of many other galaxies. Indeed, those are sometimes called quasars, which Jay mentioned in his introduction for our um, whole event today. Um, another way that they can grow, you're going to hear about later this afternoon, this is an artist's impression of the LIGO experiment, um, which showed two 30 solar mass, so now not millions, but 30 solar mass black holes in spiraling and merging together. So indeed, you can grow black holes by smashing them into one another. And the LIGO experiment is helping us understand how often that happens in the universe, and if that is an important way of building up the mass of supermassive black holes at early times. So can we watch a black hole grow? Um, indeed, this is a picture, a press release image from um, my group. This is an image at x-ray wavelengths. Oh, sorry, the little video doesn't keep running. Um, so we'll go back here. This is an x-ray image. The big multicolor image is a multi-wavelength view of our galactic center. This is the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, the emission that you're seeing here is dominated by hot gas, by stars forming, by stars exploding, which Lars Bildson will talk about soon. Um, and I'll play this video for you one more time, but while I have the still image up, I will um, point out that this blue thing here is actually a source of X-ray emission, but it is not the supermassive black hole. This blue thing is actually a magnetic neutron star, a magnetic pulsar, which is one of the areas of expertise of Vicki Caspi, who will be talking last in our session this morning. And it's really close to the supermassive black hole. So close, it's actually kind of hard to see them apart. So I'll play the video for you one more time here. You see this bright flash? Do you guys see that bright flash? That's actually a little tiny outburst from the supermassive black hole, which is sitting very close um, to this magnetar. So um, Sag A star, you can't, you can't see it right now, but the bright flash would be right where the magnetar, <laughs> where the Sag A star arrow is pointing, and the other um, blue dot is coming from the magnetar. Um, so I will just say that there are some other exciting experiments coming up. Um, the, ex the Event Horizon Telescope um, is linking together radio telescopes across the globe um, to help us get an image of the supermassive black hole. And I was gonna compare this to a hair, if you imagine me plucking a piece of my hair and somebody at the very back of the room trying to look at that hair, it would cover one arc second of angle. The Event Horizon Telescope has to get one millionth of that angular resolution in order to actually take a picture of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. So these are artist impressions of this experiment taking place um, just this spring, trying to actually take a picture of accretion onto a supermassive black hole right here in our Milky Way galaxy. So I will leave you, um, and I would like you all to remember, number one, that black holes are, and that black holes, thank you.